Okay, thanks very much. Um, uh, since this morning's uh, discussion, um, <coughs> I spent much time uh, changing my paper, as one does at TAG, so um, this is going to be a bit more off the cuff than it was before, but uh, bear with me. Uh, if my voice drops at the back, uh, also shout out. Um, I have this um, lurgy at the moment, but um, I'll try my best. Um, <coughs> what I want to talk about is uh, commercial archaeology and uh, whether or not commercial archaeology is a failure um, as, as it is uh, structured at the moment in the UK. And uh, uh, I want to ask the question, can it be fixed? And, and at the end of my paper, maybe suggest some ways uh, in which we can address that subject. Um, I guess following the publication of PPG 16 uh, in around about 1990, um, UK archaeology became uh, increasingly um, commercialised. Um, this has resulted obviously in an increase in the number of projects um, that uh, are under investigation, uh, as a consequence an increase in the number of archaeologists uh, employed uh, in archaeology. Uh, the gross value of the sector um, has risen from uh, what was estimated to be roughly £35 million uh, pounds turnover a year in about 1990 um, to some of the latest estimates I've seen, which are that um, the sector is now worth probably closer to £300 million pounds, uh, per year. You may ask yourself, where, where is all that money going? Um, with a number of large infrastructure projects, uh, not least HS2, coming online, and uh, the overall value of the sector and that, therefore the number of archaeologists employed is likely to increase over, over coming years. Many would see this therefore as a, as a successful industry. Um, but this paper will propose that commercial archaeology has been a failure on a number of fronts. Um, crucially, it has failed the discipline from which it claims its birthright. Um, it has failed uh, its participants, and, and I believe it has also failed the audience uh, which it purports to serve. Uh, what I was going to do was um, basically list things like failures of employment, uh, but I've decided to actually get rid of that. So we're just going to um, sort of enter as appropriate, and, uh, and therefore when we have the discussion afterwards, you can bring up uh, all the things that I'm likely to miss. And, and I will, will probably agree with you. Um, the reason being that, um, you know, despite the increases in funding and the employment of a larger workforce, uh, 27 years or more of commercial archaeology has failed to create a sustainable career structure. Very few archaeologists can count on a stable and re rewarding career. In fact, there is plenty of evidence to suggest that the industry has become more casualised, uh, has become less secure and is less rewarding, in particular with regard to the demise of local authority-based organisations and uh, therefore also the loss of benefits which local authority employees uh, were used to share, uh, such as pensions, enhanced leave, um, entitlement, salary, monuments, etc., etc., now, it's arguable as to whether this failure is due to a single cause, uh, and I would suggest, in fact, that a number of factors are at play. Uh, not least, uh, commercial archaeology is using a tendering model, which is based upon the success of the, of the lowest gross cost. Uh, the cost estimates are based on a per-head site attendance model, rather than perceived value or complexity of the archaeology of the archaeological resource. And uh, there is an erosion of in-house specialisms considered to be too great a burden on the organisational overheads. I think it's also important to consider whether 27 years or more of commercial archaeology has led to a more diverse and equal profession. Um, it's probably too wide a subject to do justice uh, to here, um, but it's one which um, more properly maybe a whole conference should be devoted to. Um, but surely it is a significant yardstick in assessing whether commercial archaeology has in any way advanced the discipline of archaeology as a vocation. Is failure inevitable? I mean, perhaps not. Um, the answer to at least some of these issues of, of archaeological employment can be addressed by adopting common industry, ethical and commercial standards, uh, such as, for example, removing undercutting and underbidding. 
uh, perhaps it's worth considering the adoption of the recommendation of the all-party parliamentary archaeology group and offering geographical franchises to archaeological organisations or through licensing archaeological contractors. Um, this would be maybe where the licence will require a salary minima to be upheld and would reflect a pay level closer to the national average wage rather than some national minimum wage. Um, current attempts by employees, uh, and this is going on at the moment, if you're not aware of it, uh, to restrict staff from transferring from one organisation to another where higher wages and improved terms are offered, it seems to me to be another example of a, of a very, very narrow focus. And again, uh, um, we can maybe discuss uh, more uh, failures of employment uh, later on. But I mean, one of the other aspects that, that strikes me that uh, commercial archaeology has failed um, is, is a failure to actually um, ensure access to our archives. Now, you know, we, we, have, we have a model in this country of, of, of preservation by record. It's uh, the single most <coughs> um, used uh, form of mitigation. But, you know, we, we're in a situation at the moment uh, where, where this record is largely held by local authorities, where we're actually being unable to access that record uh, due, due to, um, to cuts in, in local government funding. Um, it's an essential element in all archaeological research, surely, um, particularly so in commercial archaeology, and where projects are generated through the UK planning system. I mean, in recent years, um, this has led to, to this austerity situation where, you know, archaeologists as, as human beings are being asked to sort of, you know, assess the value of their trade against uh, social care, for example, you know, that the two are put up as, well, you know, if we didn't have to pay for archives, we could have more uh, old people in homes, etc, etc. Um, and when you think about it, you know, the archaeological profession, as I mentioned earlier, a huge increase in funding, over 1,000% in, in the last 20 years, but we're still requiring third parties to manage and, and store uh, our seed corn. So, so we shouldn't be faced with this dilemma. And um, I think what we should do is take on the responsibility ourselves and, and to do it perhaps through um, you know, a levy on, on, on that 300 million, say 1%. That would raise something in the region of, of 3 million pounds a year. This might be an easy way that we could actually fund, therefore, a, a national uh, historic environment record and archive. We could employ up to 50 AGR <coughs> officers. We could actually then sell this service back to uh, developers and planners rather than kind of relying on, on the rather sort of um, casual relationship that exists at the moment in some local authorities or doesn't exist at all. Um, we could also ensure through polluter pays that, um, you know, whoever these polluters are, be it the planning system or the developers, that they are actually paying the full cost. And I think at the moment they are getting away uh, because of, of, of this rather casual relationship with, with actually uh, being subsidised uh, both by uh, the rest of, of uh, society but, but by our profession. You know, we, we're, we are arguing that um, we ought to have these resources, but by the way, uh, here's something which is virtually uh, free. And of course, ensuring that archaeologists exercise this responsibility for the future management of ar archives uh, raises the question, if we won't do it, who will? Um, because this is a TAG conference, I thought that I should devote some time to uh, looking at the question of the relationship between commercial archaeology and academia. And I would be the first person to admit that this is a complex relationship. It's not just that um, archaeology uh, it's not just this, considering archaeology as a taught discipline in schools and colleges, but I would include all forms of archaeological research, and in particular the development of archaeological theory. A widening divide between academic and vocational archaeology was apparent prior to 1990, so this isn't something new, but it has accelerated with the advance of commercial archaeology. Commercial archaeology frequently treats academia with disdain, <coughs> and the resulting intellectual deficit is often embarrassing. Despite 95% of the UK archaeological workforce being degree educated, it is not infrequent to hear the opinion voiced that tertiary education is wasted on archaeologists. To a certain extent, this is symptomatic of, of recent political campaigns, of course, 
you know, promoting anti-intellectualism, suggesting expertise is overvalued, uh, in some instances that it's dangerous and generally that it's anti-democratic. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of archaeologists and even archaeological organisations who ought to know better go along with this rubbish. You hear of apprenticeships being set up to overcome the time lapse of three years spent in university education or offsetting the cost of a university education, uh, which of course the archaeological profession can never hope to earn enough to pay back. Uh, but um, recent job adverts are trying to now recruit business graduates on a career fast track where there's no requirement to know anything about archaeology at all. Uh, they can pick that up uh, as they go along. So, so what is archaeology losing as a result of this? Well, we're losing theory for a start. Uh, to, to the best of my knowledge, 27 years of commercial archaeology has yet to formulate a single theory of archaeological process, practice or interpretation. The common aim of the majority of commercial archaeological work is the production of an index, a matrix and a grey literature report. Not that there is anything wrong with any of those outcomes, but where is the analysis and more importantly the synthesis? There is no evidence that the thousandfold increase in archaeological funding has resulted in a proportionate increase in archaeological analysis or synthesis in publications or in outreach. Now commercial archaeology could argue that there is a resource problem and that raises its own question as to whether commercial archaeology is selling itself short. More likely, it is the kind of expertise required for analysis and synthesis is more often found in academia and not in field practice. And to that extent, the failure of commercial archaeology to engage with academia is seeing the chickens coming home to roost. Now, there are ways around this, and it does occur to me, for example, that if we insisted that all commercial archaeological organisations had a formal link with an academic body, be that a university, uh, a research institute, museum, uh, whatever, um, that that would be one way to, to restore this link. Um, it seems to me the bare minimum that there ought to be required through the Chartered Institute of Field Archaeologists registered organisation um, is that they have that kind of link. And it can be enforced upon uh, non-registered organisations as a requirement in the tender process. You know, if you want to tender for a site, you show us where this research is going to go and who's going to do it. The nature of these formal arrangements could be flexible and it might incorporate arrangements for student training, research projects, post ex analysis, etc., etc. It also strikes me that we need an online commercial archaeology journal and uh, you know, somewhere where these reports can be, um, or, the, or uh, this process can be, uh, can be reported. So um, I'm coming to the end. Uh, commercial archaeology has evolved in an organic fashion and as with other branches of evolution has often found itself um, surfing the tempting breakers that unfortunately lead tsunami-like up Ship Creek. Commercial archaeology has adopted a business plan where its major imperative is to maximise its income in support of the beer moth it has created. It does not have an agenda that supports the dissemination or support for research archaeology. It treats academic archaeology as a source of labour rather than as a source of inspiration. But a source of labour which uh, commercial archaeology is unwilling to promote or support uh, for a lifetime career. It's failed to exert management control over its results or its depository, and despite the fact that it's also the main source for both future research and, and commercial <coughs> developments. So it kind of begs some questions. There is a coming period of grace with a guarantee of infrastructure-related funding where these issues can be addressed. I wonder, however, if the discipline has the courage to be both self-critical and I think maybe a little bit ruthless, at least in imposing a regime that will guarantee its longevity in what otherwise might be uh, an uncertain future. And also, then I propose these questions that, you know, do we have the courage and the confidence to be self-critical? Is HS2 the opportunity to make up for previous failures? And is commercial archaeology at odds with the well-being of the majority of archaeologists which is where I think 27 years have so far led us. That's it.